Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Planet IMEX, the October edition. My name is Natasha Richards. I'm the Senior Advocacy and Industry Relations Manager for IMEX, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's session. COVID-19, where are we? During the session, I encourage you to use the chat as much as you like but ask that you use the Slido platform for questions for our panellists. You can access Slido to the left of the video feed on your desktop and below the video feed on a mobile device. Your panel moderator today is Greg DeShields, Executive Director of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, PHL Diversity. In his role, Greg is responsible for developing and implementing plans, strategies, and initiatives specifically designed to raise Philadelphia's image as a diverse, multicultural, destination leading to hotel room nights and economic impact for the region. It is my pleasure to hand over to Greg. Good morning, and thank you, Natasha. And I'd also like to thank the entire Planet IMAX team for putting together today's program in conjunction with us. So let's jump into it. Explore the impact of COVID-19 and healthcare disparities, learning suggestions on how your organization can have a positive effect. While the pandemic has touched every community, it has revealed the striking socioeconomic and health care inequities in the United States. The hospitality and tourism industry is amongst the hardest hit due to the fears of community COVID-19 spread through travel and group environments. Meetings and events will return. However, they may not look exactly the same. There is currently no vaccine to prevent Corona's disease. The best way to prevent the illness is to avoid exposure to the virus. Remember, maintain six foot distance, wash your hands, and everyone should wear a mask in a public setting. Amongst those dramatically impacted are communities of color bearing the brunt of the pandemic. During the COVID-19 crisis, healthcare disparities have brought attention to the longstanding inequities that pervade the healthcare system and society. So how can meetings and the convention industry make a diversity, equity, and inclusion difference? Prioritizing social responsibility. And we'll engage in that. And to do so, we'll begin with our first presenter. Dr. David Nash is the Dean Emeritus of Jefferson College of Population Health, PHL CVB's health advisor. Dr. Nash is the founding Dean Emeritus and he remains on the full-time faculty as the Dr. Raymond C. and Doris N. Gonson Professor of Health Policy at Jefferson College of Population Health. His 11-year tenure as Dean completes 30 years on the university's faculty. The Jefferson College of Population Health is dedicated to developing healthcare leaders for the future. Dr. David Nash. Well, thanks so much, Greg. Thank you everyone for carving time out of your busy schedule and uh, great to be on this fantastic uh, IMAX program and platform and a welcome to all of our attendees, literally from all over the world, and my colleagues, uh, Zoe and Loretta. Uh, wow. Well, Greg, you know, um, in my role as the chief health advisor to the Philadelphia Visitors and Convention Bureau, uh, you and I have become uh, new colleagues, along with the leadership team at the CVB. And uh, I feel as though I have learned an awful lot uh, since uh, May of this past summer. But here's the punchline. Um, we're not done with this virus and this virus is not done with us. And here in the United States, very regrettably, uh, we are seeing almost right on schedule the so-called fall surge in cases. Uh, it's not yet back to where it was in uh, March and April in terms of total numbers, and it's in a different part of our vast country now in the middle states and the northern middle states. Uh, but I have a lot of concerns about the future. But, uh, Greg, you already gave the key take-home message, which are these three things. If 60% of Americans 
wore a mask that was 60% effective when they were out and about, we would have crushed this virus back in April of this year. So the number one message I want to uh, get across is to continue to wear that mask when you're outside, continue the social distancing uh, whenever possible, and of course, improve uh, overall hand washing. These are still the key take home messages. But the short answer to your great question is very regrettably, uh, we're not done with this virus and this virus is not done with us. Uh, we still have a long way to go. So David, you are a chief health advisor. What is a chief health advisor? Yeah, what exactly is that? So uh, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for an organization like a convention and visitors bureau. Uh, I'm one of uh, more than two dozen physicians, nurses, pharmacists, epidemiologists, and others who have formed the healthcare advisory committee. Uh, I was asked to essentially, Greg, become the spokesperson uh, for this uh, committee of experts. So what I'm not is a virologist or epidemiologist. I'm a general internist for our British listeners, a, uh, a general practitioner, uh, but I'm the communicator. And my job is to synthesize the best available evidence and then communicate that evidence to all of the past and hoped for future customers of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors uh, Bureau. Uh, so we have a long list of uh, incredibly great organizations who have historically come to Philadelphia to have their meeting. And we're uh, hoping that they'll come back when it's safe to come back. And our motto is, uh, we're ready when you are. Uh, so that's part of what the Convention and Visitors Bureau is all about. But to really cut to your specific question in my role as chief health advisor, which is a brand new role, uh, I'm the inaugural office holder. And uh, my principal responsibility is to synthesize the best available science and communicate it. Maybe you could sum it all up in uh, one pithy saying, spread the science, not the virus. That's my job. <laughs> I like that. Very impactful. So let me give you a follow-up question. Considering health and safety, how will meetings look in the future? Wow. Well, meetings are going to look very different than what uh, we are all accustomed to. Uh, but uh, I, let me give you some examples. Uh, in the next couple of months, uh, in the hopes that we'll be able to have some meetings, let's say of 50 persons or more, I think these meetings are going to be characterized by uh, widespread testing, multiple tests over multiple days. They'll be characterized by uh, single service for food, no buffet lines. They'll be characterized by social distancing, even when we are in a meeting session. And I think they'll be characterized by a feeling of collective support for what it is we're trying to do. In other words, I think organizations are going to have to have a sort of a public health mindset that we're here to accomplish several specific goals and we can only accomplish those goals if we work together because together we'll be successful. If we can't commit to certain key limitations, well then our meeting will not be successful. So I think they'll be characterized by a commitment to helping one another with the goals and objectives of the meeting and some additional science and last, some changes in the physical environment, better air handling, better filtration, more attention to cleanliness in addition to spacing and testing. That's what a meeting of the near future is going to look like in my view. Well, wow, thank you. That's really insight insightful. So my last question for you is how will COVID-19 shape future perceptions of health? Wow. Well, in the United States, and uh, you and I both live and work in Philadelphia, after all, uh, the founding city of our nation, and I hope our British guests will appreciate that we still love Great Britain, <laughs> even though we're from Philadelphia. Uh, but 
how will it be characterized? You know, what is it going to be like? Um, I, I'm actually very optimistic uh, about the future. We've learned that if we could focus more on health, that we would have gotten through this pandemic in a much more successful format than we did. In other words, I'm about building the bridge between health care, delivering all the services, and creating a healthy world and a healthy environment. That's everything from reducing poverty, improving education, tackling climate change, all the things that make us healthy. So if we could focus on health in the future, we'll be able to get through any future pandemic, which by the way, is probably very likely. So we got to build the bridge between health and health care. That's what the future is all about. Wow, thank you so much, David. So let's move on to our next panelist, Dr. Loretta Sweet Gemont. She is Vice President of Health and Health Equity Professor, College of Nursing and Health Professions at Drexel University. Dr. Sweet Jermont is an expert in health promotion research. She is one of the nation's foremost investigators in the field of HIV AIDS prevention with perhaps the most consistent track record of evidence-based HIV risk reduction interventions. Dr. Jermont leads Drexel University's Community Civic Engagement Initiative. We, hear, we are here because we care building healthy communities together, which is designed to partner with the community to identify health and wellness concerns within the 10 West Philadelphia Promise Zone communities and develop health and wellness programs to improve health outcomes by implementing community-driven sustainable programs based on the community voices. And I think that is so incredibly important to make the transition over to you. So Dr. Sweet Jermont, I'd like for you to talk to us about COVID-19 and healthcare disparities. Hello. I don't know where to begin. There's so many issues when you want to talk about this healthcare issues related to, to COVID. But you know that since there are so many disparities right now related to this, it makes you want to think about where, what should I say? But let's say that African Americans and Black Americans have been hit the hardest by this virus and account for a disproportionate, you know, number of people with it and a number of people who have died with it. Now, it also has led us to know or feel that there are so many issues that impact us with social determinants of health being one of the big things of poverty, you know, education, environmental issues. Um, and then we have lack of trust, lack of trust with the community, lack, lack of trust with the healthcare providers. When I talk to people, one of the major things they say is that, Dr. Jemite, I don't trust them. I don't trust what they say. I'm, they, I, I'm, I'm feeling lonely and isolated. You know, I'm having a lot of uncertainty about the messages and the messengers. You know, so we have all these factors are, are, uh, are coming together around this devastating issue of COVID in, in the in black and brown community in which we live and grow and thrive. And so issues of social injustice, racism and oppression, all these things impact what's happening to this community related to COVID-19. And so what do you, can we do about it? It's a real issue. And one of the things that happened in Philadelphia is that there was a group of doctors called the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, which really worked together with the black community to really um, for, formulate a way to do testing for free and information for free. They formulated a mobile van and they would go to different places and do testing when testing wasn't available to the community. So to increase testing, to increase information, but what's happening is that in spite of all this testing, we still fear the next step, which is contact tracing. You wanna do contact tracing in this community? Are you kidding me? And then you want to talk about vaccines, but the, you're kidding me. <laughs> and so all of these issues that are important to moving us forward with improving the care and outcomes of this community, is we got to take some steps back because it's the same issues of fear, mistrust, uncertainty that's going to get in the way of our movement. How do we deal with this? How do we fix this? You know, we work with everybody, we come together, but it's community engagement, man. We cannot deal with any of these issues unless we take our time to hear the voices of the people that we're trying to serve. This pandemic is really devastating the impact on the community. If we don't take our time to understand what their thoughts and feelings and needs are, 
we are going to be just doing the same old thing that we always do is do what we think they need to do, what, what they need to have instead of finding out what they want. One professor that I talked about before, this guy named um, Eli Anderson wrote this wonderful book called The Code of the Streets. And he talks about it in a given way, if you want to work with a given population to improve their health, change their behavior, save their life, take the time to understand the code of their streets, to really try to figure out what they want, what they need, so that we can develop programs based on um, what they say. Community voice, community engaged initiatives are the best way to improve any kind of health issue that we have in, in the world, not just in America. When we did this stuff in South Africa and Botswana and in Jamaica, we connected with the community at every level, at every way to give voices to the issues before we designed any kind of programs to promote their health and well-being. I can go on and on and on, so I'll stop to <laughs> you are certainly passionate for it, and you give us a great deal of motivation in thinking about the ways of how we engage with various communities. And I want to follow up with that because, you know, in our audience, there are a number of individuals who certainly want to engage in local communities when they bring a meeting or convention to a particular city. What are some of the best ways, or at least is there one particular strategy that you would recommend that they take as an approach to reach out to communities to uh, create engagement initiatives? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I think that one of the things that I really learned in working in, in the field and working in the community is giving time to build the trust to get people to talk to us. Because if we don't do that, we'll never find out what they want. And so I created this thing called the eight T's of community engagement. And one is time, you know, to build the trust, to be transparent so that we're really listening, to really talk with them and not to them, to really build a team and know that they have talent, ask them to be part of what we're trying to do, you know, um, tenacity to never give up because the community can really help us with all of our initiatives. All of us who are here today are on, on this Zoom call and are meeting right now are movers and shakers and fundraisers and event planners and can do all these things that can really make a difference in the communities that you're trying to reach out to. So one way is to think about what you're going to do for the community or the city where you're going to be going in and connect with community leaders or uh, people who can really do something. Because you might say, oh, I'm going to go down there and do something with the homeless, but they don't want that with homeless, they want something else. And so figure out what they really need. And But if you do something with the community leaders and bring them in vote, because what I learned is that this is what they said to me. It says, Dr. Jamal, we are tired of being planned for. We want to be at the planning table. Can you invite us in? You know, we're either going to be on the table or we're going to be on the menu. So can we be at the table? You know, and so, and we are valued and respected. Include us in. We're good people. And so we have talent. Put us on your team. And so the way to do this, when, we, when you come to these different cities, whether it's Philadelphia, New York, California, Africa, wherever, try to figure out a way to engage the community, find out that they have talent, use them to help you with your initiative. And, and, and it, really, trust me, whatever you do is going to go better and better and better and better because you have taken the time to hear the people to get their thoughts and move with them. That's my suggestion. So as a follow-up, you know, as you think about organizations that reach out, and even if they have early engagement to talk about collaboration, you know, what is a realistic objective uh, that should be pursued to kind of display a positive outcome, to show that they actually achieved something? Hmm. You know, um, that's, that's, that's a very good question. And one way to do that, I'm thinking right now, uh, is that, invite somebody to be at the table of your planning committee. So if you put somebody from the community on your plan, I say you come into Philly and you're trying to figure out who to connect with in Philly to be on a planning for your event, by the community seeing that you have invited somebody from the community to be on the planning, but you have made a big deal already. Because now if somebody looks like them, walk like them, or talk like them, they can really give input to what you want them to do in the community and then they will bring their other people right along with you. So the way to show that you're really doing this is invite somebody from the community to the table. Great, I love that. So one last follow-up, because you did reference it earlier around the social determinants of health. How can a organization, or better yet, can you identify a key um, community aspect of the social determinant of health that an organization can plug into to also make a difference? Uh, there's so many. 
And there's so many don't know where to begin. I mean, you can think of poverty, but you can't. Poverty, you need jobs, you need training, and you need education. You think about homelessness, or people need money to deal with the homelessness issues to get a job to be able to find a place to live. You know, food insecurities. There's places in the community where there's no food, so you got to figure out what can you do about food. So, man, I don't know where to tell you to start because there's so many of them, but we got to figure it all out because if we can do one well, then we do the other well. But you got to figure out... Um, how to connect them all together. And if you fix one thing, can you fix multiple things by doing a few things? You see what I'm saying? So think about what we could do to, as a group that can fix multiple things at one thing versus trying to pick them apart because they're all interrelated some kind of way. Because this is where people eat, live, and work, and breathe. And so it's right there in your face all the time. And it's hard to change discrimination. Hey, if you want to change discrimination, isolation, inclusivity, man, is the way. But how are you going to do that? You got to change the thinkers at the table. A conscious bias really makes a difference. And so all these things that we want to change on the grassroots level got to be changed at a higher level too. How are you going to do it? Make it happen. And you know what? I like what you said. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're ready when you're ready. <laughs> so <laughs> we're ready when you're ready. And we're going to move this thing together, correct messages with the right messenger and spread the science, not the virus. So we're going to do this thing together. So let's be ready. Philly's ready. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I want to move to our third panelist. Uh, Zoe Moore is a certified diversity practitioner and co-chair of MPI's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Zoe Moore was honorably discharged from the United States Army, thank you for your service, in 2014 after 12 years of service. She graduated from the California State University East Bay in 2016 with an MS in Hospitality, Recreation, and Tourism. Immediately choosing events as her field of choice, she conducted event services for several clients locally and abroad. While very passionate about logistics, operations, and strategies behind events, her primary interests concentrate on advocacy for inclusion and diversity in the meetings, events, and tourism industry. And in full disclosure, she's one of my best collaborators in terms of articulating some of the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I couldn't think of anyone better to kind of segue into a discussion about the value of diversity and inclusion. So uh, Zoe, if you could take it from here. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's uh, great to be with you again, Greg, and seeing you virtually. I can't wait till we're face to face. Uh, the value of diversity, equity, inclusion is a long conversation, but it, it starts with a lot of these different research firms and like M McKinsey and Harvard have said that diverse teams are smarter. So when we talk about the value of DEI, we're referring to how people are represented, afforded opportunities to resources and, and for upward mobility. We're also talking about how diversity across all dimensions of identity result in smarter teams that outperform homogenous ones by 35%. That's more money. So when we talk about the ROI, the bottom line, and people need to say that, show me the money, there's the money right there. 35% is a large percentage. Uh, diversity uh, being a result of equitable and inclusive organizational cultures means that individuals are thriving, they're optimized, they're more engaged because they are seen, heard, supported, and recognized uh, for the value, the value that they bring. So it's getting away from the ideology that people need to be a culture fit, but that they're a culture add and they bring value to your organization, to your company, to your, your meeting or event. So as a follow-up, one of the questions I have for you would be, why is it important for meeting planners to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy or plan? But one, because they have a plan for everything else, right? We have a plan for marketing. We've got site management plans, project, mark, you know, financial, everything. And so whether they recognize it or not, a strategic plan for DEI is an integral part of all those plans flourishing. As a human-centric industry, we cannot afford to ignore the people that we plan for, nor the people that we work with. DEI in our industry is important because we interact with so many people, so many stakeholders, both locally and abroad. And so when we work with those different social identifiers to effectively plan for their needs, we have to become well-versed in their value. And uh, Dr. Jamat, really, I, I love your quote when you said, you know, people said that we're tired of being planned for, invite us to the table. So. Yeah, it's important that meeting planners understand what's going on in their, their local community and involve the people that bring that, that value to what they do. 
You know, we hear so often about a diversity, equity, and inclusion assessment of an organization that's really amongst the first steps around a diversity and inclusion strategy or plan. Do they really work? Um, yes, if done correctly. You know, a lot of people would love to just throw a few questions uh, on a piece of paper and, and pass it out to their membership bodies or their, their team members or community. And that may not be as effective as a, using a firm um, like Kaleidoscope Group that I like working with or, you know, these different organizations that are out there that can put together a proper survey that will help you identify kind of the core issues going on in your organization or company when you're planning for an event, when you're in a new city. And with that information, you establish benchmarks and benchmarks help you set objectives and then identify those key results that are gonna be measurable in order to get to those objectives. So yeah, they, they can be very effective because like a medical examination, you know, a doctor cannot make a, a, give you a prescription without having knowledge of who you are. So that's, that's what an assessment is for, is, is to really identify what you need to focus on because everything is not the same across every organization. You know, what you may think is one thing you wanna focus on, it may be something else that's changing your organizational culture and an assessment will help you identify that. So I wanna shift quickly to supplier diversity. It's really been described as one of the more immediate ways to launch a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. What are your thoughts around that? Uh, I, I would hesitate to say immediately because a, a strategic plan is imperative uh, for developing a sustainable supplier diversity, sustainable. So it's not just doing it for one event for show, not being performative, but to develop a sustainable supplier diversity program, um, you know, it, it's important to have that strategy. But I will say as an advocate for underrepresented businesses or, you know, that are black, indigenous and people of color, that I do want the industry and event planners, government agencies to take an immediate look at their preferred vendors list especially how vendors, suppliers, service providers are procured. There's a lot of talented professionals out here that are getting overlooked or bypassed in the selection process and that RFP process. Uh, and sometimes because they're unaware, and then sometimes there's just social economic barriers and, and getting to the different meetings and so forth and so on. So supplier diversity is super important because again, where the, where the ROI, where the bottom line hits is that uh, underrepresented businesses have been proven to uh, meet customer satisfaction more than 70% of the time. And so these vendors and suppliers that are diverse are coming in and just showing out. They're innovative, you know, and, and they're amazing your clients. And so it, it's good to tap into the community and see the different array of uh, suppliers and vendors that are out there. Great. So this has been an amazing panel and such. We've gotten a number of interesting questions. So I'm going to surface one that's been presented for each one of you. So David, the first one is for you. As we see a new surge, do you see extended bans on meetings and conferences? I hope we don't have an extended ban on meetings and conferences. And you know, Greg, it's largely up to us. So if folks want to be able to go to meetings, wear a mask, be socially distant, wash your hands and uh, set a good leadership example for your organization and for your family. So I hope there's not an extended ban. Uh, paradoxically, we have the power to uh, reduce the time until we can all be together. It's in Thank our you. hands. So Loretta, this question came in for you. What successes have you had when working in a community and why do you think that success took place? Wow, okay, I'm trying to think about which example, but what I will say is that the success has been, us, my husband and I and our research team being able to identify the needs and concerns of the community based on their voices and designing interventions to improve their health by, based on 
their voices. And so not just us doing it, but doing it in partnership with them. And so all of my evidence-based HIV risk reduction work is based on community voices and community leader, you know, leadership and partnership. And the work I'm doing right now with Drexel right now is based on listening to the voices and engaging. And you know, you asked me, why did it work? Why did it work? Because it's the concept of caring. If people believe that you trust, if, if you, you've got to be trustworthy and they see you as trustworthy and transparency, then they think that you really care. So it's that common concept of caring that people really need to know to move forward with you, to do what you need them do for you. And so that's, if you care, we'll do it. We're with you. That's the, the whole thing that Dr. Nash was saying, and we're here, we're ready, because we care. And right. my whole initiative in West Philly is because we're here because we care. <laughs> Thank you. So, Zoe, um, what are you hearing regarding travel policies or various corporations and associations in society? What are they doing around issues of, you know, travel um, as it relates to the impact of COVID-19? Yeah, uh, I'm doing actually my first trip in a long time next month. And, you know, I, I like what I'm hearing. I, I see a lot of precautionary steps being taken, you know, the middle seat being removed. Um, the the sanitizing after and before flights, um, the wearing of masks, the, the the signs on the floor. So a, a lot of planning that's going into um, making a lot of confusion at times, a lot of information that's coming at us a little more easier to process. And so that's key as a planner, you know, is that we create that environment. If we create a, a tense environment by making everything feel um, you know, too scary, then that's the energy that we put out into the, the people coming through different airports. So the travel policies are just keeping us informed and coming from, you know, a source like the CDC. And I, and I you know, advise most event planners just to, you know, have your, your trusted sources, like Dr. Loretta keeps saying, you know, that trust is important. Have your trusted sources that you go to, but also just be aware of all the information that's out there. So, yeah, I mean, we're just being inform kept informed and especially by different trade associations as well. David, uh, another question has come in that is really asking the question about um, as we approach the fall and the winter and how individuals are able to distinguish that difference between flu and COVID-19, can you share some insights about how they should approach that? Yeah. Yes, that's a great question. So the best answer is let's all get vaccinated with the flu shot and try to do it uh, by the end of October. That would be fantastic. And remember, historically in the United States, we've had, uh, you know, tens of thousands of deaths from uh, the impact of the flu. So distinguishing the flu from COVID-19 is clinically not that easy. And that's part of the challenge that we're going to see in primary care, in emergency departments. Um, it, you know, certainly a history would be important. Anybody else sick in the family, especially children, because they are going to be in school bringing home either COVID and or the flu virus. Uh, typically, uh, the achiness and the fever, well, that could be COVID, that could be flu, but the achiness and the uh, mostly respiratory symptoms, that sounds more like flu. At the end of the day, the most important thing is to continue to do all the things we're doing, wearing the mask, socially distant, good hand hygiene, and for the flu, getting the vaccine. It's especially important in the young and in the folks over 65 in those two populations, most especially because they can have, uh, you know, very serious consequences. So flu shots are really important. That's the most important thing. Now, it's not always 100% effective, as we know. Scientists sort of guess uh, using the best available evidence, what is the particular strain of flu this season. But I have an optimistic view because of decreased travel and distancing and masks. I'm hoping that we actually don't have a very tough flu season. And there's already some early evidence from other countries, most especially Australia. They're finishing their summer, right? Uh, so they've already had their summer. And uh, we've seen, uh, we have not seen a big 
flu problem in uh, countries like Australia, which is a good uh, harbinger for us that maybe we'll be okay. Main answer, Greg, get a flu shot. Great. I got mine two weeks ago, so <laughs> I'm living it. Good. So Loretta, uh, a follow-up question. Uh, while we know that COVID has really impacted, you know, diverse um, uh, communities uh, in very significant ways, they are distinct communities. Can you talk a little bit about how a organization that perhaps would like to be supportive of diverse communities, how they might approach, let's say, the African-American community differently from the Hispanic community or the Asian community, um, given the international engagement that you've had? Are there some insights about how you tailor it to a specific community? You know, one thing that I learned along the way is that every community has leadership. And so you have to figure out how you're going to get into a community, how you're going to get invited in, and how's your your approach going to be valued. And so, um, and whether it was I've talked to Latina community, the African American community, the Asian community, I had to find a way in through their leadership team. You know, you know, there's civic associations, there's faith based leaders, there's block captains. Everybody has a say, and sometimes there's multiple ones in a community. So you got to figure out who you're talking to and how you're going to get. But the most important thing is you just got to be flexible and wanting to get in. And then you want to get in, you want to stay in. And so I'm um, wonder that no matter what they say, no matter how hard it is, because community engagement work is not easy. Community engagement work is hard. And it takes a lot of time. It takes your commitment to do this in a way that the people can trust you, because trust doesn't happen overnight. And so we want to do this. Plus, as, we, as, as folks around the table who are listening to this, are coming to these communities to do some of this work, it could start right with your staff. You know, you have staff of color who live right in the community that's going to be working with you right in the city that you're going to be doing this in. You can find out some things from them, but you don't just want to talk to the mayor of the city or the president. You want to try to get down deeper into um, the community in different kind of ways. And so you'll be able to identify that through the, the different leadership resources that are existing. Talk Great. With your team. Thank you. Talk with your team, because your team, your team is coming, might already know some of that stuff. Great. And then, Zoe, so, uh, early on, we had talked about social responsibility. That's really the key uh, approach that the uh, folks in the meeting and convention industry should really take. Can you talk about social responsibility and how that really plays in terms of the industry's commitment to provide meaningful and impactful uh, DEI work uh, as they engage in community engagement? Absolutely. I, I think it's, again, piggy, piggybacking off of, of both panelists and, and Dr. Loretta, you hit it on the, on the nose that community engagement takes a long time, um, but it's when you want to partner with authenticity. That's what we call it. It's that idea that when you do engage the community and you understand the value that they're bringing to your events, whether it's innovation, whether it's a different food or the, the knowledge of the local community or the economic impact that you make, um, the community does see that. They, they start to build awareness that when you come in, you're creating jobs for the community or you're hiring or procuring local businesses. And so when you do get in with those leaders um, and understand the value that they bring and that it's not a favor that you're doing to anyone, but that it's that they have a say so. And again, that, that culture adds to what you're bringing. So that social responsibility now, beyond uh, understanding that value is, is that, like I said, the economic impact. If you become aware of that, what we as event planners or meeting planners bring to local economies, uh, starting with job creation, we, we have a, a better conversation and we plan better events. Great. So I have one last question that I'm going to present to all three of you because I think all of you could provide a very interesting perspective. So the question is, how do you see minority groups being comfortable to travel and meet? Also, what are some of the things that you think uh, various destinations should do in preparation of diverse visitors? Mm. <laughs> and I do want to remind you, I lead a division to secure diverse <laughs> multicultural meetings and conventions. So anxious to hear your response. First, start by emailing Greg. There you go. <laughs> I mean, again, we, we go into that direction of talking to the experts, you know, like 
uh, find out from, um, there was a great example of a, of a city leader, I can't recall right now, but back to that partnering with authenticity, call people to the table, right? Like find out the different social economic barriers, the health disparities, the, the needs, the food uh, needs, what's going on? Like you have to talk to people and that's part of the strategy is that you cannot leave people out of the conversation. Don't plan for people, let them plan with you. Like that, don't you? I love that. I love that so much. Like, stop planning for people. Like, don't, don't assume you know uh, what somebody else's, you know, challenges are without actually engaging them and getting to know them and building a relationship, partnering with authenticity. Like, that is, that's it. David? Yeah, so I'll, I think that's a great question. Uh, my own experience has been, as Zoe alluded to, uh, with our customer advisory board uh, for the Convention and Visitors Bureau, listen to what their concerns are. Uh, you know, you can't assume you know. So it's good communication, listening, and uh, they'll tell you what's on their mind. And of course, let's not forget, every group should have a Greg DeShields. I think that's something we can all agree on too. But the listening, uh, you know, you have two ears and one mouth. So if you listen, uh, you'll get what's on their mind, and then you can address their fears, concerns, unique issues. I mean, I've learned a lot from the customer advisory board as just one example. Great, thank you. And I then Loretta, if you could close this out. Okay, well, thank you for that. I think community engagement, man. If you wanna see why people get minority groups to be comfortable to come in to the cities that we're gonna be traveling in, engage them in different kind of ways, talk to them, listen to them. But what Dr. Nash and, and Zoe was saying in terms of meeting people where they are, our goal is meet them where they are and take them where they wanna go. And that's what we can do if we listen and hear them and engage them in, in, in the right way. And so we were getting ready to have a big convention here this July. You know, my sorority was coming to Philadelphia and we were all pumped up and then COVID came. And so the AKAs couldn't come. Oh, thousands of them were coming to Philadelphia. We were ready. The hotels and the, everything was ready. Mm. Now we couldn't have it. So, but to do that, we was getting ready to have health fairs. We were connecting with the city. We were doing all the health issues. We had a mobile van, breast truck going on. For, we were doing all the stuff in the city that was important to the health of the community. And so that's one way, if you're going to bring an organization to your city, try to find a way in which they, they can do something that really impacts the city. Again, that's related to community engagement, listen to their voices, making sure we hear them, and being committed to wanting to do something with what they hear. Because one thing you can listen to what people say, the second thing you can do is to do what they say. Because they Very say cool. you listen all the time, and just, you still come and do what you want to do anyway. <laughs> so listen, try to do it, and work in partnership. Well, Loretta, Zoe, David, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the time you've given us to give this very insightful session. Uh, Natasha, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Greg. And again, our thanks to the panel for sharing their unique insights. This is a conversation that could go on significantly longer. But for now, I would urge all of you to enjoy the remainder of our programming today, enjoy the reef environment, and thank you for joining us on Planet IMEX. Goodbye. <laughs>